Greetings, Alpha Citizens. This is Craig Allen, and these are today's top stories on Alpha City News. Mr. Zero and the Factory of Death. Neo Deities vs. Anti Gods. Gargantua lands Big Fish. Noxon steps up campaign. And the Bright Man and the Blue Bear come together to do good. All on Alpha City News, right now. From Alpha City, the home of the superhero, comes the only newscast that gives you all the super news in the city or the world. Alpha City News with Craig Allen. The events of Monday would seem to indicate that Mr. Zero's dogged pursuit of the shadowy machinist could be bearing fruit. The machinist first came to authorities' attention when Red Eric, captured by Mr. Zero along with Bad Penny Copper for teleporting sky cars to a remote warehouse in order to rob the passengers, revealed that the advanced technology used had been provided by the unknown villain. Following this small clue, Mr. Zero has spent the last months doing the unseen work of law enforcement, tracking down possible leads and suspects, following possible lines of production and materiel that might lead to the machinist. Zero's search led him, late Monday morning, to a factory-slash-warehouse located just inside city limits. Supposedly a small family-owned business that produced parts for engines, Mr. Zero's investigation revealed that the only surviving member of that family was bedridden following a serious stroke, having retired from active participation in the business when she turned 65 almost 15 years ago. Even with this, the factory had never ceased production, but had also been buying large amounts of various industrial products far outside the needs of a simple parts manufacturer, with all communication being handled on the internet or, when absolutely necessary, by phone. Mr. Zero found his suspicions confirmed when, upon entering the factory section of the building in question, he found a huge industrial setup of which the production of engine parts was only a small part. Before his investigation could go further, though, Mr. Zero found himself locked in a cat-and-mouse game with the building's security, composed of a small army of sophisticated mechanical sentries. Without realizing it, Mr. Zero found himself led to the center of the complex, where he discovered a large bomb, upon which a note was taped, saying only, Goodbye, Mr. Zero. Realizing the danger he was in, Mr. Zero used two aces he had up his sleeve, courtesy of his friend, Edison Rao. The first, a device which could create a small area electromagnetic pulse, disabled the centuries around him, allowing Mr. Zero to leave the building at high speed. The second, a personal force field which allowed him to survive the blast, which went off as he exited the building. First responders found Mr. Zero unconscious but alive amongst the rubble of the now-destroyed building. He is expected to make a quick and full recovery. We here at ACN send our hopes not only for that swift recovery, but that Mr. Zero is able to bring the insidious machinist to a richly deserved justice with all due speed. Johnny Munson, boy photographer, reports from the edge of the universe, where he has been accompanying the Neo-Deities Izar, Exegesis, and the Infinite Kids on a quest for one of the seven great artifacts of the old gods, the Revelation Engine. The pictures sent back show the Neo-Deities and the Anti-Gods locked in a desperate battle on a barren planet orbiting a blood-red star. Some details have emerged from study of the pictures. The Infinite Kids, beset by Auntie Agony and her Lady Destroyers. Their protector, the Forever Man, striking a blow against the winged Mathengazar the Silent. 
exegesis breaking the assault of uncountable deathling knights, and most troubling, the mighty Izar bearing the brunt of a deadly attack by Abraxas, the lord of the anti-gods himself. Abraxas, also called the Form Destroyer, was last reported trapped on the planet of despair, home of the anti-gods, locked into an eternal repeating moment by the first hierarch Isaac of the Neo-Deities. Unfortunately, the photographs, which arrived at the offices of the Daily Alpha Citizen by Sidereal Slide, the method of transport used by the Neo-Deities, were alone, and do not show the end of the battle. We can only hope that Johnny Munson, boy photographer, doesn't miss his next deadline. Gargantua, staunch member of the Hero Union, found herself standing knee-deep in water off the coast yesterday. Being that she was at her maximum growth, measuring a full 48 feet tall, knee-deep means she was in approximately 12 feet of water. Of course, a hero of Gargantua's stature, no pun intended, wasn't simply enjoying a fine day being huge at the beach. Acting on intelligence provided by the Atlantean Emissary, and working in conjunction with the Coast Guard and Navy, Gargantua was standing ready to intercept a medium-sized refugee from Kaiju Island. And she didn't have long to wait, as less than half an hour after taking her position, the Kaiju, a shark-lizard mix running several dozen tons and measuring slightly more than 35 feet, rose out of the waves. While a wing of Navy fighters distracted the Sharkazard with a rain of bullets, Bergantua closed with the monster, stuffing its enormous, tooth-laden mouth with a large sphere. Biting into the sphere by instinct, Sharkazard found it to be filled with a paste which adhered to the inside of its mouth, rendering the most potent weapon in its arsenal useless. The surf was churned into foam as Gargantua and the nuclear sport wrestled with one another, Gargantua's extra height balanced by Sharkazard's claws. The battle seemed evenly matched until Gargantua managed to grasp Sharkazard from the rear and performed a punishing suplex upon the creature, knocking it insensate. This gave the Atlantean Leviathan-class monster escort waiting just off the shore time to secure Sharkazard, in preparation for bringing the Kaiju back to its island home, as part of a containment fleet composed of both Atlantean and League of Nations ships, marking the first time surface and underwater navies have worked together. Gargantua, having reduced to her minimum of 12 feet tall, was treated for minor lacerations on the beach, although she seemed to be most annoyed by how her uniform now spelled strongly of Sharkazar. Tragedy struck at the Eisner University Astrophysics Department Friday afternoon when an explosion destroyed a laboratory, apparently killing graduate student Jamie Evers. Evers had been using a diamond-tipped drill to take samples from a meteor fragment given to the university several weeks ago by the High Frontiersmen, apparently trying to pierce a layer of unknown metal discovered just under the meteor's rocky surface, which had been preventing full analysis of its composition. There are several theories about what might have set off the explosion, but all that is known for sure is that at 6.22 p.m. on Friday, a large section of the Astrophysics Lab building, thankfully almost completely empty, was rocked by a blast, the power of which brought down ceilings and collapsed walls, rendering the entire building unsafe destroying countless experiments being undertaken in various labs, and resulting in the death of Jamie Evers. Of the four people besides Evers who were in the building, only fellow student Meyer Abrams was close enough to the blast to be seriously injured. Abrams, before lapsing into unconsciousness, told first responders that he had witnessed a huge black shape standing in the smoking ruin of the laboratory where the explosion took place. The shape had bellowed the word Viad before vanishing into the smoke. 
It was only after a review of security footage from a number of different cameras in the area around the building that Abram's statement was lent credence as a shape matching his description was caught on three separate feeds. City and university officials are hoping to bring in either the High Frontiersman or Empyrean to look at the wreckage in the hope that some sort of energy trail might be found leading to the current whereabouts of the Viad creature, currently wanted for questioning in the death of Jamie Evers. Richard Tricky Dick Noxon has lately stepped up his campaign for mayor following a dip in his polling numbers, stemming from his honesty about the need for an increase in city services to the poor and indigent, a restructuring of the city tax code, and questions from his opponent, Alderman Michaels, about his past as a super criminal. Against the reported advice of his campaign manager, Tricky Dick held a press conference in which he declared that no question was out of bounds. Over the course of the next four hours, Noxon spoke candidly about his years spent using his uncanny ability to influence people to do what he wished, his capture and trial, and the twelve years he spent in prison. He described his years in a cell as the most challenging of his life, when, for the first time, due to court-ordered injection of the power-inhibiting drug interferase, he was forced to live a life in a harsh environment without the crutch of his powers. Since his release from prison, Noxon has continued taking weekly doses of interferase, taking his latest dose during the course of the press conference, and making his record of supervised administration of the drug public. It seems as though his honesty is bringing good results, as a straw poll of likely voters still shows Noxon leading the race, although by only a slim margin. In related news, Noxon appeared Tuesday with James Blue Bear Neater and Anders Brightman, the Bright Man, who were announcing the creation of the Blue Bear Foundation. The stated goal of the foundation is to provide aid to the homeless, the hungry, low-income individuals and families, and those in need of mental health care. Nieder, a successful entrepreneur prior to the onset of his own mental illness, has invested a large amount of his own money creating the foundation and in beginning its operations by providing food and supplies to the 4th Street Homeless Shelter. At this point, Mr. Nieder approached Anders Breitman's Eudaimonia organization. Mr. Nieder's foundation exactly fits the remit of my nonprofit, the bright man said, when asked why he had chosen to partner with the new foundation. Eudaimonia is an ancient Greek concept central to Aristotelian ethics and political philosophy. It can be translated as happiness or welfare, but my preferred definition is human flourishing of seeking the greatest fulfillment possible for as many people as possible. The Blue Bear Foundation will be directly involved in increasing the ability of those whose means are terribly limited to achieve an improved life through helping them to receive the basics needed by all people to simply survive, and helping them build upwards from there. It's a worthy goal, and we are proud to be part of it. Nieder himself read a short statement saying, in part, my mental illness, which I allowed to go undiagnosed and untreated, cost me much in my life, but I have recently realized that I have also gained much, in terms of wisdom and understanding about my place in the world, and what I can do to help those in need. As the Blue Bear, I thought I was helping the city by stopping crime, but as I brought my illness under control, I realized that I could do so much more, and use my skills in a better fashion by direct action and fundraising. I realized that I could make a difference, make the Blue Bear mean something in a much deeper way than I could have ever pictured before. Mr. Brightman seems to agree, and we both look forward to making the Blue Bear a rallying symbol for Alpha City's efforts to help its citizens in their times of need. We here at ACN are proud to say we support the Blue Bear Foundation. There have been a rash of robberies over the past few weeks, 
all of which seem to have been carried out by what are now being called Burst Babies, the purple-skinned individuals affected by the otherworldly burst of energy caused by the defeat of the Deep One in orbit some months ago. The Burst Babies, described by some witnesses as looking like they are entirely covered by horrible bruises, have made off with large amounts of rare earth elements, such as Iterbium, Prometheum, and Scandium. All of the robberies have been marked by the burst baby power of causing horrifying hallucinations amongst those present, some of which have lasting effect on individuals, and was first demonstrated during the kidnapping of more than a dozen patients from a medical facility some weeks ago. It is unknown why the group is collecting the rare earth elements, and investigation is ongoing. Dr. Escalapius of Eisner University's Center for Super Medicine issued a cautiously optimistic statement Wednesday saying that Radiant had been responding well to treatments initiated by Jamarganon. Jamarganon, the Jewel Star League's designated defender for our area of space, is powered by the same black dwarf star energy that Radiant was infected with while she was held captive by the Gatan prior to her return to Alpha City in the guise of Black Maria. The device Radiant used to force the Gatan to abandon their human shapes seems to have caused an imbalance between her natural energy-producing powers and the Black Dwarf Star energy, and this is what led to the coma she has been in since the day of what is now being referred to as the Second Battle of Kirby Park. Dr. Escalapius stated that Jamarganon was using his advanced knowledge to begin bringing Radiant's warring internal energies back into balance, and that she was responding very well so far. The doctor did warn that this process of balancing was just beginning, and would not hazard a guess about when Radiant might be fully recovered. Still, there is a notable feeling of relief in the city, simply from the news that our hometown heroine has taken a turn for the better. And now, this week's Super Combat Scorecard. Twin heroines Donut and the Golden Hen faced off against the twin villains Carbon Copy. The Legion of Odd danced with the insane mime Posse. The one-man dance crew and Funkbot brought the beat to the Arrhythmic Man. Mr. If matched wits with the big question. The Owl and the Crow fought on Battle Hill rooftops. Earthmover buried Sandtrap. Presto the Witch teamed up with a time-traveling Siegfried the Great to trap a gaggle of dream thieves. Lady Lunar got an assist from Heavyweight while battling the Skydiver. Big Bad Daddy Longlegs lost out to Structure, the living building. Clockface and the Timekeeper escaped from prison, eluding the Conundrum Corporation. The Sugar Plum Fairy and the Nutcracker got their dance ruined by Jack of All Trades. Big Weird Joe grappled with Octo Squid. Johnny Gundam and his giant robot wrestled with the steam intelligences of Altair 7. And lastly, Nikola Tesla Point 2 traded lightning with the Wizard of Menlo Park. You've been listening to Alpha City News with Craig Allen. It was produced by Carter Lee. Sound beds were provided by Newsbeds.com. Wherever you found our podcast, please go back and leave a review if you would. And if you enjoyed the show, please tell your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please drop us a line at alphacitynews at gmail.com. Until next time. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have a super day.